You and I both know that there's been aspirational projects that have been on the books to protect Baton Rouge and other locations. How do we take these aspirational projects and turn them into reality? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question, and the, and the reality is when you look at it from a, from a public interest perspective, uh, you end up saving significantly more money by being proactive and making the investments on the front end in making your communities, communities more resilient as opposed to coming in and doing disaster recovery on the back end. And, and an example of that, uh, following the 2005 hurricanes, uh, Hurricanes Katrina, Rita, um, some of the other smaller storms, uh, the federal government spent somewhere in the range of about $140 billion. And I'll say that again, spent about $140 billion doing recovery and response work. Uh, had we been on the front end of that, we could have saved 80 to 90 percent of the flooding disaster and 80 to 90 percent of the lives, and I remind you, Louisiana alone, perhaps around 1,500 lives lost, um, by simply proactively investing 8 to $10 billion. And, and so the equation is really just extraordinary from a, a cost-to-benefit perspective. And we, we have this am amazing reactionary approach as opposed to being more proactive and, um, and, and being more cost-effective. And so um, there are a number of reforms I think we need to, to look at the Corps of Engineers, HUD, Interior, USDA, FEMA, many of the agencies that do resiliency work, and we need to fundamentally change how they carry out their work today, how that work is coordinated, how it's prioritized, and, and, and certainly happy to get more detail on that. We've got some, we've got some ideas. Sure. Uh, so obviously when you uh, were working for the state and you led the, uh, uh, the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, you worked quite often with the Army Corps of Engineers. What do we need to do to turn the Corps of Engineers into a best-in-class organization? Sure. Uh, so my father's a civil engineer, and, and when he uh, got out of college, he often talked about how being employed by the Corps of Engineers was the gold standard. That was the, that was the job you hoped to eventually get to, uh, and, and no longer is that the case. Um, I think it's important for us to think of two things. Number one, if you were starting an agency today that was responsible for resiliency, responsible for ecosystem restoration, responsible for dredging, what would that agency look like? If you were doing it, you were responsible for it, what would it look like? Where would it be housed? Would it be an independent agency? And I'm gonna bet, I'm gonna bet that virtually all of you are thinking, you know what? It wouldn't be in Department of Defense. And, and so the second thing I wanted to say is this. You know, this last presidential election, it doesn't matter who you voted for, who you liked. There was a, there was a thematic motivation that, that was really just, just profound, pervasive through that election. And, it, and so if you were a hardcore uh, liberal, uh, you might have liked Bernie Sanders. And if you were a hardcore conservative, you might have liked, uh, you know, Ted Cruz. Um, but then you also had a number of other candidates, of course, Donald Trump and, and, and Ben Carson, Car Carly Fiorina. All five of those candidates talked a tremendous amount about discontent, dissatisfaction. The federal government's not representing me. They're not doing things that I feel like are in our best interest. And so it doesn't matter if conservative, liberal, th that really was one of the things that motivated the election more so than anything else. And there was this interview on, I think, CNN where they're going through interviewing all these millennials. And they went up to him and they said, well, who are you going to vote for? And, and every single one of them, well, I think I'm going to vote for uh, Bernie Sanders. Okay, well, what happens if he doesn't get the nomination? Eh, Donald Trump. And they're like, wait, what? <laughs> but but, but it, people didn't care about Jeb Bush's tax plan or Hillary Clinton's jobs plan or whatever it was. It was about who's best articulating that frustration I have. And so I want to go back and tie this back to the question. People are discontent with the performance of the Corps of Engineers. They're discontent with the performance of the federal government. And this is an opportunity for us to truly make those transformational changes, those disruptive changes, to, to, to put something in place that we look at and say, you know what, actually, that's a good idea. That's representing me. That's cost effective. I'm okay with my tax dollars being spent there in, in this way. So I think the infrastructure package and some of the things that, that we're working on right now provide an opportunity with this new administration. Agree, agree. So obviously in your subcommittee chair, uh, chairmanship, you have the opportunity to move the needle. There's some amazing projects out there. We've got the Panamax scenario. We've got ports that are underdeveloped. We had a panel here on manufacturing earlier. And if we're going to move manufacturing or pit to port, we need to improve our port scenarios. So as far as your subcommittee is concerned, are you coming up with a list of major projects that we can push through our trillion dollar program? Well, 
uh, rather than doing projects, what we're, what we're talking about is we're talking about metrics. We're talking about priorities. Every project that's out there, and all of you are aware of the tens of billions of dollars in backlog uh, through the Corps of Engineers alone, um, we're never going to finish those projects. And so we're working on a few things. Again, the metrics issue. What, what is in the federal interest? What are federal priorities? What do we care about? Instead of going out and trying to throw a nickel at every $10 problem across the country, let's truly prioritize. One of the problems with the Corps of Engineers, I think, today is the fact that their, their um, salaries and expenses largely comes out of project costs. So if, if ultimately $10 million is awarded to a Corps of Engineers project that you're working on, the Corps pays their staff and pays their expenses out of that $10 million for the project. What that does, if you're, if you're a, a lawyer and you have clients on retainer, you don't ever want that retainer client to, 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 to leave you, right? You don't ever want it to leave you. I'm afraid that we've put a perverted incentive in for the Corps of Engineers to keep projects in the study phase or in the construction phase. We just finished a report, a study for, for a project in the state of Louisiana. It took 42 years to finish it. I'm, I'm not kidding. 42 years. You can't make this up. And so I think our incentives are wrong. I think the role of Congress is prioritizing, determining what's in the federal interest, putting the metrics in place to help prioritize those projects and dollars, making sure that we're providing funds in a way that finishes the projects instead of does this progression that doesn't even keep up with inflation on the project cost. Um, and then we also have an obligation to streamline the, the regulatory or permitting type process to where um, uh, when uh, infrastructure package is ultimately delivered, you can turn dirt, and we're not talking about studying, going through permits, and other things. And look, we can do it in a way that's sensitive to the environment, sensitive to public safety and, and health, and, and certainly we need to do that. But, but there are a number of different models out there that have been used that, that demonstrate greater efficiency than, than the regular uh, regulatory and permitting process we use today. Absolutely. And, and from an economic development standpoint, obviously the trillion dollar program is going to kick kickstart the middle class is going to kickstart a number of elements that happen. How do we get these agencies aligned where we can exact real change and get them to pivot? So do you believe technology plays a role in that particular scenario? When, when, I, made, um, when I made reference to, to metrics earlier and priorities, uh, absolutely. I think, that, I think the technology plays a role in that we have so many great data sets that exist today, and we have the ability to use those data sets and use technology to help us prioritize, to depoliticize decisions, and truly make investments that are in the public interest and deliver the best bang uh, for the buck. Now, most of those best investments are in Louisiana, of course, but uh, uh, no, but seriously, we, we, we have an opportunity, I think, with technology and data to do a much better job. And when I was working for the state of Louisiana, for the first time ever, we integrated seven different models, computer models, had never been done before. And we developed a prioritization system. I was in a scenario where the legislature had just given us $200 million. And I go to our team and said, okay, guys, where, what are we doing with this money? And they come back and give me a list. And it was a great list. And part of it was structural and part of it was non-structural. And hey, this looks great. How'd you build it? Well, Senator so-and-so likes this one, Representative so-and-so likes that one, Mayor whoever likes this one, Parish President, our county folks uh, like this one. And I just looked at him and I said, are you crazy? I said, how am I going to go before a legislative committee and explain this? Sure. And so we, for the first time, 2008, we started developing this prioritization system that ultimately we advanced the fourth generation. OMB called this in. We've had foreign governments come visit us when I was working for the state and said, gosh, help us uh, reproduce this for ourselves. And so uh, technology plays a huge role. And, um, and, and, and in terms of getting the agencies on the same page, it goes back to we have to identify federal priorities. We have to look at all of these disparate funding streams that are being used, and we have to start funneling them in the same direction. And again, going back to Louisiana, we identified 42 different funding streams, federal, state, private, not-for-profit, that were being and, and local government, that were being used to, to, to move forward on different types of water projects that were being done in stovepipe manner. And we brought them all together. We ended up pulling together about $22 billion, ended up being one of the largest civil works projects in, in U.S. history. Uh, through the reorganization of our state agencies and the reorganization of the dollars. Very good. Obviously, through your career, you've had a great track record for negotiations uh, and bringing people into alignment. So maybe you could give our, our group a uh, good understanding of your role on Deepwater Horizon negotiations <laughs> and, uh, and how you worked with BP. <laughs> I'm not sure BP would say that. But uh, <laughs> uh, so the, 
the, the BP settlement ended up being the largest settlement in U.S. history from a single company. And I'll tell you that we had some rather contentious negotiations. There were five states at the table. There were five federal agencies at the table. Uh, you can imagine all of these people trying to protect their fiefdoms. Um, but, but I'll go back to data. Um, you know, one of the things that we did, and I think was, was, a, was a good move on our part of the, by the state of Louisiana, is that we immediately, following that oil spill, began going out and collecting data to help understand what types of impacts were, were occurring in the state of Louisiana. And, and so, um, and I won't get into all the oil spill criteria, but, but um, in many cases, you actually have the, the responsible party that pays for a lot of this stuff. And so it'd be like a, it'd be like a, a murder scene investigation where your murderer says, I'm gonna pay for, oh, look at that. Uh, uh, <laughs> I see some former negotiators in the room. Uh, <laughs> is that a gun? Um, so, uh, so, so, so we were able to develop our own data sets and, and instead of relying upon the responsible party to give us data sets or to help pay for these data sets, which, which I think was very helpful. At the end of the day, we were able to largely keep the negotiations and the outcome based upon data that, that showed or, or, or um, quantified the impacts to the different states, to different entities. Um, and look, this isn't an exact science, it's not. Um, but, but we did a very good job, a very thorough job using technology, using some of the best uh, uh, scientists around the world to help inform us. And, and ultimately, you know, this thing in many instances began getting influenced by politics and folks, you know, saying, look, politically, I can't go out and say, that we're accepting this much. And so the more that we relied upon data, science, and, and really what the outcome showed, uh, the, 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 the more we were able to keep negotiations on track. Um, so th that's, the, you know, that's the thing, and, and it goes back to my comments earlier about metrics. If you're, if you're using metrics, you can help to depoliticize some of the, some of the funding uh, uh, situations in Congress and in, in the White House and in uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and other agencies and an infrastructure package. You know, using data and using metrics to determine where is our federal interest and where's the best bang for the buck. That's great. And obviously in your scenario now, you've got situations like if you look in California, the Orville Dam, they went through serious flooding. We had the flooding in Baton Rouge, flooding in Houston. Uh, we had Superstorm St Sandy in New Jersey. So you're gonna be able to pull from both sides of the aisles. How is that going for you right now? Are you seeing that same uh, drive and determination to get a program completed? There, there, there certainly is bipartisan interest, there's no doubt, and I think that uh, infrastructure is one of the things that brings everyone together. Uh, everyone has a road or a bridge or a, a levee or an ecosystem restoration project that they would like done. And so it certainly pulls folks together, but um, you know, as we move forward, as you know, you, you know, the devil's in the details. So if we are able to start establishing metrics or priorities, um, I think that's when you start getting into the details where you potentially are gonna see some division. Um, if, you, if, if I were responsible for this, one of the first things I would do is I would go out and I would sit there and, and begin taking an accounting of where all of these bricks and mortar uh, funds are being spent today. And I, and I said it earlier, but whether it's Department of Transportation or it's the Corps of Engineers or it's HUD or it's FEMA, Interior, Agriculture, Department of Education, um, so many agencies are spending money on infrastructure investments today. Uh, Department of Commerce, through EDA, you have the Appalachian Regional Commission, the Delta Regional Commission, the Denali Commission, so many entities. Let's, let's corral all that stuff. Let's get a handle on where we're spending money, how we're prioritizing it, what the cost shares are, uh, determining the criteria they use today, and, and is this in the federal interest? And, and, and really get an accounting there. Uh, one of the things that, that I'll at least say we need to look at that, that that's gonna be a contentious issue, but even looking at um, in, in cases when there are violations in lawsuits, how those dollars are being spent to uh, carry out remedial activities. Uh, we just did something in the law in December. We set up a, a pilot program called Environmental Banks, and it applies just to South Louisiana, where we've lost 1,900 square miles of our coast. And the idea is, it, let's see if we can figure out a way to, we've determined that, that, that ecological restoration, coastal restoration in Louisiana is a priority for our economy, for our uh, ecosystem, for our fishing community, for our, our coastal communities, all of, it's a priority. So instead of doing wetlands restoration over here and oil spill or neuro restoration over here and doing air quality remedial work over here, finding ways to, 
to really put all of the funds or prioritize that to centralize it, to allow us to use different conversion or translations between, okay, here's a water quality, uh, here's water quality funding we have to use for mitigation, but we need to do wetlands restoration. Let's figure out how to convert that. Let's figure out how to do an air quality violation and convert it into ecological restoration and, and, and just try and channel dollars in, in a way to where you can finish things, complete them, prioritize them. So this pilot uh, program, again, called Environmental Banks, it's similar to a wetlands restoration bank concept, but provides for much greater flexibility, provides for pre-mitigation where you could go out on the front end and do mitigation. Um, the, uh, uh, there are about five federal agencies in the state of Louisiana that are involved in writing the, the guidelines. That'll be completed uh, probably by December or January, uh, this next December or January. And, and, and I think ideas like that, models like that really can be uh, very effective in, in, in allowing us to truly see economies of scale and completing large-scale uh, projects as opposed to, again, all this piecemeal work we've seen historically. That's great. Well, obviously a big fan of data analytics as well, and I think that's going to also attract the private component, and we've talked a little bit about public-private partnerships here today, and from your role and your eyes, how do you feel as though the private investment community can support uh, over the next four or 10 years mm -hmm. with a trillion dollar program. Well, so you talked earlier, you made reference to post Panamax vessels, the, the renovation of the Panama Canal that allow, now allows for vessels that are both wider and deeper than uh, historically what were our largely deep draft ports in the, in the United States. Um, uh, for example, the Mississippi River, which uh, facilitates maritime commerce for 31 states. Uh, the, the, the dimensions of a post Panamax vessel can't fit on the river anymore. Um, and, and so, when you when you start looking at investments in many cases, deepening a river, investing in a port, um, you have um, a ways of monetizing those benefits. I mean, the deeper the draft, um, you, you can literally, for every one foot of, of river draft you increase it, it can be millions of dollars in cargo on different types of vessels and different types of cargo. Um, uh, and, and so there are beneficiaries from making investments in the right infrastructure projects. And let me just reiterate, when I say right, I mean projects that truly have public interest, that truly are priorities. Right. And looking at some of those projects and determining, okay, so, so who are the winners here? Who are the beneficiaries of this project? And then monetizing that. And it's as simple as, as um, if a company wants to come into an area that's congested, and if they want to use their own dollars to build an alternative route, then let them put a toll. I think people understand that concept. Here's an alternative route. It's faster. We're going to put a toll on it because we built it with our own dollars, and we're going to recoup our spending. And of course, we're going to get a profit as well. And so we're going to move forward on that. And, and even in the environmental field. Um, so in environmental field, uh, if if you go out and you go do wetlands restoration work or ecological restoration, you begin getting the benefit of that ecological productivity uh, earlier on. And so you can make an investment today of a million dollars, but as that ecological productivity uh, uh, begins to occur, you, you can actually monetize that. Okay? And I, I, I know I'm getting in the weeds, but I'll give you an example. Mm. Let's say for, for an oil spill or for an uh, air violation or, or some type of chemical spill. Um, the way that you quantify these, these impacts is that you look at the impact, not just to how much uh, the water quality or air quality might have been impacted, but you look at habitat impacts. You look at the number of species that were impacted. And they actually monetize it. So let's just make up numbers and say that a duck, a duck is worth five bucks and that a, a speckled trout is worth uh, eight dollars. Well, well, so, and, and you can quantify habitat, you can quantify species. And so if you carry out a restoration project earlier, then, then, then perhaps a polluter or a responsible party was planning on doing it. Then that ecological productivity starts today. And so it, it severs that loss. It, you're no longer having speckled trout die or ducks die or whatever it is. So you sever the loss. You start beginning that upward trend. And so, and so there is a benefit to carrying out restoration early. You can monetize that. And so I think there are so many opportunities, deepening uh, navigation channels, making investments in port infrastructure, making alternative routes on roadways or adding lanes. There are so many opportunities for us to have public-private partnerships. And I think the tax code plays a role in incentivizing them, as well as the overall infrastructure package and making sure that you have public participation in, in those as well. Very good. I know you have a very busy afternoon, so we're going to roll it up. Yeah. Thank you so much for your you time. Bet. Yeah, thanks so much, Congressman. Yeah, thank that you was great. very much. Hey, um, I, um, look, I want to say this. I, I need to take off, but I want to say this. Look, I assume most of you are practitioners in the infrastructure field, financiers and other things. 
don't sit on the sidelines and wait for things and say that was stupid. Um, I'm going to do things based upon my experience and the input that I get, as are other members of Congress. To the extent you have ideas and thoughts, reach out to us. We want to make this as good as it can be. And going back to my earlier comments about frustration, people are frustrated with the, with the performance of the federal government. Help us perfect that. What are you doing in the private sector that's different from what government's doing? And share those ideas with us. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.